mercy, mercy, mercy. Thank you for joining me again, Sebastian. In a previous installment, Sebastian, you mentioned there were theological implications of this devotion. Could you expand upon that? By the way, thank you for having us back on. I'd like to start off with the reason why I've taken interest in this is because I think there is a grave danger to, to souls here and the message that's, that's being sold. There's many, many good Catholics that have taken on this devotion with, with good intentions, with not focusing on these people. Our job is to inform, not to convince. And so we'd like, like the comparison where I'm going to be going and looking at uh, is the actual change of definition of mercy that happened from the time after the, Se the Second Vatican Council uh, and the introduction of, of a thing called the Paschal Mystery, which basically replaced the, the act of redemption or but maybe not replaced it entirely, but certainly overtook it in this way. So one of the points here I was going to make and expand on was that the devotion fosters the act of presumption here. This can be clearly seen even in the diary where throughout the diary there's over 1,400 mentions of mercy or merciful. Now the diary has about 600 and whatever pages so to give you a comparison, the word repentance and repent are used only 18 times throughout the diary. So that shows you the complete and utter disproportionate use of that. Also, I think it's in the New Testament, if I'm correct, the word mercy, merciful, is only used over 200 times. So seven, seven times the amount that's used in, in the diary. You can make your own decisions upon that. However, to, to expand on this, what we have to cut, or what we focused on, what I looked at, this is thanks to obviously the work of Father Peter Scott here. He helped us look at the theological aspects. So a lot of it is on I'm actually uh, summarizing his work on an article. And the understanding of mercy, how this was understood uh, before. So before I go into the understanding, of give you the, the definition of mercy in tra traditional Catholicism. I'd like to just mention that it was the canon priest Ignacy Luzitsky, who under John Paul II was chosen as the theologian to defend the new devotion of the, to the Divine Mercy. His work was over 500 pages, so he basically writes that the notion of mercy that is underlined in this devotion is in some way different from the traditional teaching of the Church. However, he obviously doesn't explicitly say this. It comes out, obviously, in his writing. Now, if I give you an extract of one of the passages here, it's, I quote, Unfortunately, in the history of the church, the awareness of God's mercy was lost, but it still existed. In the common understanding of God by theologians and the faithful, there has been an overemphasis on divine justice. It's understood strictly juridically. Now, this unacceptable criticism of the church presupposes in one way that he knows better, and he's found a newer and better way of, of understanding mercy that the church did not have beforehand. We know, obviously, from what spirit that comes from. So, again, this overemphasis on mercy, which excludes justice. Now, what was the traditional understanding? He also says this, and I quote, with the exception of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, the tridentine rites of the holy sacraments do not emphasize reference to God's mercy. Now, this is manifest to anybody who has any familiarity with the traditional rites that this is not true. For example, take the prayers which are pronounced in the traditional rite before given absolution in the confessional or Holy Communion during the Mass. And I quote, The Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you for your sins, and bring you to life everlasting. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant your pardon, absolution, and remission of your sins. Amen. Likewise, the triple prayer before Holy Communion, Domine non son dignus. Examples of the profession of our unworthiness and dependence on God's mercy are found in practically every prayer. So, consequently, it is not reference to God's mercy which is lacking in the traditional rites of the Church, as we can see. Professor Rozhitsky perceives to be missing a certain thing that he talks about it. it is the new understanding of mercy 
which in some way excludes justice and which was introduced into the reform liturgy after Vatican II. Hence he writes, prior to the revelations received by St. Faustina, there was no separate orderly worship of divine mercy in the church. St. Faustina's propheticism is of great pastoral importance since its effect is to introduce into the life of the church the devotion to the divine mercy. But what about, for example, the devotion to the sacred passion of Christ, to his sacred heart, to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her Immaculate Heart. These are all treasures of mercy long in the church. Clearly for Father Rogitsky here, this is something radically new and different about this devotion to the Divine Mercy, which was promoted by Sister Faustina. If it has introduced a devotion to Divine Mercy, that these other devotions, which have been have got a long established history by Catholics, are not devotion to Divine Mercy, as he understands it, he obviously feels that this new devotion is something better. He makes a frequent reference also to the encyclical of John Paul's second Divis in Misericordia. This encyclical was written to develop a new notion of divine mercy following the Second Vatican Council and is summarized by this quote that Father Rozhitsky gives. The Paschal mystery is the culmination of this revealing and affecting of mercy, which is able to justify man. The Paschal Mystery of Theology is a novelty that changed the whole notion of mercy. Yet Father Rosicki does not hesitate to affirm that there is a strict connection between the Paschal Mystery of our redemption and this feast. Looking at the Divine Mercy Sunday and the graces that it promises. In the 13th and 33rd revelation that Sister Faustina received, namely the extraordinary graces attached to receiving Holy Communion for the first Sunday after Easter. This is in the diary 699, and I'll quote the diary here. It says, My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the Feast of Mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls, and especially for poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon these souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which grace flows are open. Now, this is an extraordinary promise that was given in the diary. The question is, is it compatible with Catholic dogma and the teaching of the Church? I'll point out it definitely is not. Now, presuming that Holy Communion is even received in the state of grace and is preceded by confession. Uh, traditional teaching, it was always when a indulgence was given, confession it could be eight days before and after for the graces and the plenary indulgence to, to be received. The presumption is that communion automatically brings about the remission of all sins and all punishments due to sin, as well as going to confession. So it's enough for us to go to confession eight days, let's say, before or after, and be in the state of grace and receive the Holy Communion. Our sins are then remitted and all temporal punishment as well. It's certainly true that Holy Communion can remit venial sins. This depends on the depth of our contrition, obviously, for them and the fervor of our love to God. It would be very presumptuous to think that all of the venial sins are certainly remitted by a sacrament, which is not principally instituted for, for the forgiveness of sins. This is obviously confession. But who fully perceives and regrets all his venial sins? Who loves God as he ought to? Moreover, it's certain that the contrition for venial sins is necessary for them to be forgiven. If there is no reminder of this, as in the case of with the reception of a plenary indulgence, how can the soul be expected to have the correct disposition for this holy communion? Now, we know that only one sacrament that actually promises for, for the remission of sins and for all punishments to be wiped out. That is the sacrament of baptism. As we know, most Catholics receive this sacrament when they're infants. But let's say when people who convert to the Catholic faith take this sacrament of baptism, well, this is the only time in their life that that's such graces are. According to this promise that Sister Faustina is talking about in the diary, the graces received just on this day. So throughout 364 days of the calendar year, these graces yeah. aren't given just on this one actual day of the year. So it goes above Easter Sunday, for example, or any other day. So that 
graces that one would receive is the same that one would receive as well in baptism. So you'd be getting, let's say, for the price of two sacraments, they're throwing in another freebie in the third sacrament. This is un unheard of in, in the history of the church. As I say, it goes against the teaching of the Catholic Church on the basic sacramental teachings. Interesting is that it even contradicts what the post-Vatican II Church then came up with. So in 2002, the Vatican came up with the plenary indulgence for Divine Mercy Sunday. This was two years after Divine Mercy Sunday was initiated into the church. It's on the Vatican website. It talks about the plenary indulgence in that one has to be detached even from the smallest of sins. This has always been the, the understanding of indulgences because a plenary indulgence can be partial or full. So one is not fully detached from even the smallest of venial sins. One can receive a partial plenary indulgence, not a full one. How does one know whether one receives a full one or a partial one? Well, the simple answer to that, to that is we'll know on the other side when we'll have our personal judgment. So, so that's something that we we do not fully know. So this is also in complete contrast to the promises given in, for example, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the first Fridays. There is nothing about wiping away temporal punishment, for example, in that, or in the first Saturday devotion as well. This is a completely new thing that came about. The way Father... Ignacy Rosicki tried to basically justify this. He says, if God can grant it through the sacrament of baptism, why could he not grant it if he so desires through the Eucharist, which is the greatest sacrament? Now, if you go even on the Divine Mercy website, you'll even see this referred to Divine Mercy Sunday as a second baptism as well. So these promoters are actually saying this. this these are not my words these are the words from the promoters and of course god can give any graces that he wishes to anybody that he wishes he's not limited by his holy disposition but to make an act of personal devotion a regular and infallible means of obtaining extraordinary graces and to make it equivalent to a sacrament ultimately applies a different notion of mercy that the church wishes to teach father rozhitsky does not hesitate to affirm the universality of this grace. He writes, all people, even those who hear Thurto, never have devotion to the divine mercy. Even sinners who repent on the day of the peace itself can participate to the fullest extent in all the graces which, which Jesus prepared for this feast. Well, this is an incredible affirmation, as I mentioned to you by the Apostolic Penitentiary of June 29th, 2002, namely to grant plenary indulgence under the usual conditions and in, in the vatican document i quote it says so the faithful who on the second sunday of easter will divine mercy in any church or chapel with a heart completely free from any attachment to any sin even venial sin will take part in pious practices performed in honor of the divine mercy so even the neo-modernists didn't go as far as what this diary is promising and there's a lot of contradictions as nate will then later mention the church has never officially, as far as I know, has actually said that the locutions or the visions of Faustina were supernatural. They were never, ever given the title of the content de supernaturale. This is given for private revelations that are approved by the church. The way the divine mercy was introduced was, let's say, through the back door. In 1978, when the ban was lifted, it was only the ban lifted on the devotion itself. The reason why it was done was, was basically to speed up the beatification process of, of Sister Faustina. I'll probably let Nate go into the details of that if he wishes. But in 1981, the diary was then published. 1993, Sister Faustina was then beatified. And in the year 2000, she was canonized. Nowhere between 1978 and 2000, or even 2002, when the Feast of the Divine Mercy Sunday was, was introduced, is there any talk of her, her visions being supernatural, which is quite interesting to look at and, and to compare. Why was this never approved? That's a topic for another day. The Paschal Mystery 
was rooted in Novo theology back in the 1950s or earlier, so just before the Vatican II, it, it was fostered. It was, it was the understanding that redemption itself wasn't complete with the death of Christ. It was only manifest in the resurrection and his ascension. The promoters of the Paschal Mystery taught that basically God made one covenant with man, and that happened at creation, a covenant they called of love, which is continued in the Paschal Mystery. Now, this is a false understanding, which I will discuss. St. Paul affirms that this new covenant, who, so there was the old covenant and the new covenant, as we know, he affirms this new covenant, and he says, for those who are Paul have the faith in Jesus Christ. It is therefore not for all mankind, as John Paul II says, for every human being in his encyclical uh, Divis Misericordia. Uh, Which is according- interesting that they changed the uh, words of constant consen- consecration for, to... for, for many for all yeah although I've, I've a good explanation of that that it doesn't actually change the validity of the sacrament and that's that's a discussion for another day but according to the, the paschal mystery theology all mankind is redeemed by the love that god had for them in his creation if this understanding is true then there's no need for faith there's no need for baptism penance and the sacraments and even the church as we know the church christ instituted his church for the salvation of souls this this is the basis of modern day ecumenism and i give a quote from gaudin and spez which john paul ii quotes in, in his encyclical he says by this incarnation christ in a certain way united himself with every man this is pure utter naturalism it is grace that we receive that allows us to be saved not our human nature I think in the past few days, there's been a lot of discussion about this new document that's come out in in the Vatican that infers the dignity of human man through his dignity that he is is saved, not through grace. Or grace is is, is obviously put on a second tier here. I'm talking about the document given now by Cardinal Fernandez. For us to accept this new understanding of mercy, we'd have to reject a lot of Catholic dogma. Unfortunately, one of the reasons why many Catholics who who are very kind of into this devotion or in the Novus Ordo, unfortunately, because they have a poor understanding of catechism, the wholeness of Catholic faith, they think that what is promoted, what is given to them in this devotion, in one way being blindly obedient, but with good intentions in, in a certain respect, they're not able to see the contradictions of what was taught before and what is taught now. These two things cannot be married up together. This is not, as Benedict the Sixteenth would say, hermeneutical continuation. There is a danger, therefore, to our Catholic faith, account of this ambiguity and the truths of the faith that aren't clearly expressed. This devotion is, therefore, a danger to, to people's souls on account of the modernism that's inherent in it. It's what we would like to point out in these things. I'm not trying to criticize this devotion just for the sake of it. I'm saying there is perfect substitutes for this traditional devotions that are not at all have any problems in them. And they enhance our Catholic faith and our understanding of the sacraments. Whereas this devotion on on many levels actually contradicts many of the sacraments as well, as I showed you here. The sacrament of baptism, it contradicts of extreme unction in the divine mercy. There's a promise there saying, if one unceasingly says the chaplet at the hour of death, this grace given then will help that soul to be saved. Well, we know that, that it is not true. It's the sacrament of extreme unction penance and allows the soul to be in uh, sanctifying grace, not saying a chaplet. This is very important. I'd like to give also a quote by Father uh, Garibou Lagrange, who points out that there's a clear obscure in this supernatural mystery of redemption, which unites justice and mercy together. As I mentioned, the devotion fosters the sin of presumption. It also gives a new notion. The definition found in every pre-Vatican II catechism is very simple. Mortal sin is a grievous offence against the law of God, and venial sin is a lesser offence against it, but still an offence which incurs debt justice. It's very important to understand this. Consequently, sin, although it cannot harm God in himself in any way, nevertheless creates a disorder that must be repaired in justice. 
It does not just harm the sinner. It takes away from God that honor and the glory that are his due in injustice. It does not just make man unhappy, but deserves God's wrath punishment. Among the many texts so, so from St. Paul that prove this, but the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and injustice those men that detain the truth God in justice. It's interesting that the 1992 Catechism of the Catholic Church, the one that was given by John Paul II, although it admits secondarily that sin is an offence against God, it defines it primarily as an offence against reason, truth, right, conscience. It is a failure in genuine love of God and neighbour caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It wounds the nature of man and injures human in solidarity. So consequently, it is man sin harms, not God. Satisfaction and justice for this offence against God is therefore no longer necessary or appropriate. Man simply has to be corrected by his reestablishing his relationship with God and his neighbour. It is this that New Catechism means by saying that the sinner must make satisfaction and expiate for his sins. This term or terms are placed in quotation marks in the Catechism of the Catholic Church to indicate that this is not the same literal sense as in the past when these terms meant making up to the justice of God for the offence of our sins. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installment. I'll be back again soon with another one. But in the meantime, please pray for the Church. Mercy, mercy,